Okay, you told another story from around around the same time, and and again, only a, a music fan. So you you distributed NME for that yeah. little while, and I really I. I I didn't have anything like it, but I related to it because I thought when you are so passionate about music, you just assume everybody feels the same way as you, right? Right. You feel like, how could you not? Yeah. And so was it a complete surprise that that you couldn't really, get, not you, it wasn't your responsibility, you were just distributing it, get enemy off the ground here, really? It it was, it was absolutely shocking to me, but you know, it's, it's funny. Um, I think a, there's a, a, a number of, you know, answers to that question, because I think, um, you know, when there's a lot of reverence for uh, magazines like, you know, Hit Parader or um, Rock Scene or Cream, you know, and but they were, there was a playful element to it and kind of a lot of, you know, Cream especially had the humorous aspect. And I liked the more serious writing that I found first in Crawdaddy and, and, um, you know, like like Paul Williams writing in in the Procol Harum album, it's something he says. Uh, you know, this album "Shine On Brightly" by Procol Harum is a record. You know, I uh, I would have a a, 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 a need for, uh, or it was a record I had a need for in my life. Or there was some really grandiose sort of statement like that, and I felt like the British journalism. That, that's the way people wrote about it. It was like, you know, and you think about at that time when I was distributing the anime, there was four four rock music weeklies coming out in London. I mean, that had to be the coolest, you know, city for rock and roll at the time. I mean, it was just, it was uh, so exciting. And, um, and the way they wrote about it was uh, just deeply reverent. And of course it was included all kinds of fun and humor, but but it wasn't the same as the, you know, kind of, well, you can, listen to music or you can go to the movies or you can do this or that. It was like, no, music is everything. This is, this is, you know, or this is for people who feel music is everything. And that's how I related to it. And I really, and I'd been reading Melody Maker uh, and, and it, you know, we, at that time it was only coming over by boat. So they'd be like five weeks old by the time you read it and the covers would be tattered, the newspaper and all that stuff. We had one big record store down, uh, 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 magazine you know store downtown called shinders where they sold newspapers from all over the world and and um and i used to have they had a little file box in the back and i had a card there with my name on it and they'd save me a copy of the melody maker when they got them in so i go down there every week and get it and you know of course melody makers one of the greatest music magazines ever but at that time they were a little they had a big folk section they were a little stodgier they were a little slower to, to come into the seventies and, and embrace the, you know, the glam rock that was coming in and all that stuff. And when I saw the NME, the first issue of the NME, I saw actually oddly enough had the beach boys on the cover, but it was still a fascinating read. And all of those writers, Nick Kent, for God's sakes, and um, Paul Morley and some of those guys, uh, Charles Shar Murray, um, you know, they're, they're, they were just the fantastic writers and they just, you know, reading their excitement about records that I hadn't, heard yet you know fed my excitement um you know uh I, I remember reading about this new band I, I mean I can still picture this uh, article about this new band called Roxy Music and they said um that they had a, a guy in the band that went simply by the name Eno and that his current project was recording Earthworms and I was like I gotta hear these guys and I mailed away for their I did a lot of importing you know uh mail order from England and I got the single Virginia Plain before the album was even out and was like, you know, you'd never heard anything like that in your life. They were so absolutely original, um, you know, and that all, you know, that was all inspired by the enemy. It was, so when I got the chance to distribute it, I was like, I was over the moon and, um, you know, to distribute the first issue with excerpts, a little flexi disc on the front with excerpts from the upcoming Rolling Stones album, Exile on Main Street, holy cow. You know, that was I was 18 years old. I was like freaking out, you know. So, yeah, it was that was a great time. It was so much fun uh, to get those papers and to watch David Bowie hit the cover for the first time. I was a massive Bowie fan and and had fallen hard for him on the Hunky Dory record. So to watch that whole thing happen and just explode was, you know, a, an amazing event in my life. I had to travel to see him because he didn't come to Minneapolis. So I. I took a Greyhound bus to Chicago and Detroit to see those Ziggy Stardust shows when he first came to America. And it was 
life changing. So, yeah, I love it. So, Rolling Stone was not even compared for you like well i loved rolling stone too i mean i bought that i bought that and subscribed to it i mean so you know and and there was a lot of i mean a lot of great writers in there too uh so i'm not knocking that necessarily but i love the british writing better i i think before nme i was reading a magazine called zigzag i don't know if you remember that it was more of an actual magazine format and um that was uh uh, if you're familiar with the rock family trees do you ever see those uh really they're the huge fold out pages oh, with yeah. yeah that's where the rock family trees were born in zigzag magazine a guy named pete frame started drawing those intricate things about where all these musicians came from and where they ended up and and anyway so zigzag was a it was a another one i subscribed to as a you know 15 16 year old yeah now you can do i go to the at the grammy museum they have like those trees like you can th- this band is tied to this band like you could just kind of tap and you can hear the music I, I, that's i'm i'm there for a long time like trying yeah. to seeing that they have books of the pete frame family trees that you can buy if you ever get a chance they're they're treasures oh, oh nice 